Kulturen. So. Um, so let us start. I think we are all here. Not all, of course, but OK, let us uh, wait for some people for the joining, but let us start meanwhile. So uh, I'm very happy to greet you all uh, tonight and today. Uh, this is our event dedicated to uh, seven lessons for, uh, from playing board games for table makers, and that's a very interesting one. Uh, topic. So first of all, let me start with introducing our speaker today because uh, our speaker is a really special guest. Uh, this is our colleague uh, Przemek from Polish chapter. Uh, so um, uh, we are really happy to greet you today, Przemek. And Przemek is actually uh, is holding a very high title. Uh, he is the head of group transformation office at Allegro company, which is the largest e-commerce platform of European origin today. Uh, so we are really happy to greet you with such experience. Um, also, uh, Pstemek um, uh, served as head of operations and head of project management office uh, before joining this big company in another very impressive company called NetGuru. This is one of the uh, dynamically developing consulting company. Uh, also, Pstemek had a wonderful experience working as program manager uh, in Dubai in Thomson Reuters, MENA. And uh, apart from his main job, he is also the uh, lecturer and the founder of Transition Management Academy at Kazminsky University, uh, which is in Poland. Uh, I know this university. I have one of my best friends studied there, so it's amazing to have you here today, Przemek. Apart from that, I would like to announce to uh, for all our guests that Przemek uh, holds uh, several certifications, including uh, project management professional, Program management professional, uh, which is really impressive for us here in Kazakhstan, um, professional scrum master and Prince 2 practitioner. So uh, I think I made uh, a big introduction to you, Shem. Sorry if I missed anything, you can add. <laughs> And uh, with this, I would like uh, to give you the floor, Przemek, to talk about how we can really think outside of the box while playing some board games and finally excel in our profession as well. I think this topic is really interesting. So uh, but the stage is yours, Przemek. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Yulia, and thank you for, for, for the warm introduction. So you see so, so many uh, companies and titles, and I do not know how to do the blur background. Uh, behind me so you can see my working environment as working from home. Um, but I'm sure a number of you can relate with that. So uh, first, uh, please let me try my Kazakh, right? So, Salementis B, Kalaisis. Hopefully I did not butcher it that well, that much. Yeah, uh, that was amazing. Thank you. <laughs> we are really great. Thanks. <laughs> So it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let, let me uh, let me move to the presentation. So I'll be sharing the presentation, and I'll be speaking in uh, in English. Uh, if any translation would be needed, then then hopefully we will be able to do some something a little bit later on. Uh, so let me just move uh, move here. Mm. All right. This this one. Okay. So hopefully you'll be able to see. My screen here. Do let me know. Yeah, we can see that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, we can see. So if that works, that's perfect. Then let me start. So we're going to seven lessons from playing board games, uh, and uh, I'll give you a short, brief introduction of how I got there. Just before that, when you signed in here, hopefully you were looking for some kind of uh, those learning objectives or, or things that you can take out from this session. So hopefully you have a little bit of the entertaining way or at least getting to know a little bit more about some of the board games and the power skills that you can practice through them. Uh, then understand the mix of the things that you can apply both in your professional life and change makers reality and in the board games. And finally have the winning strategies in, in some of those at least that worked for me, uh, obviously. Now, uh, before I start, you already heard the introduction. I worked with uh, with Thomson Reuters, that's Information Co uh, Corporation, with NetGuru, that's Digital Consultancy, and currently with Allegro. You can imagine this as a smaller Amazon, right? We're one of the 
biggest in the world and the biggest of European origin. And I do come from the Project Management Institute, the Poland chapter. I've been volunteering there whew, for 12 or 14 years. Now, um, as, as you can imagine, I speak Polish first, English second, so, but that's probably true for everyone here that English is your second language. So if something doesn't work, then hopefully we'll be able to move through it. Uh, this presentation is constantly evolving. I've given it um, two or three times now, and I always get great feedback on how I can improve it or what to give to, to change and so on. So it's a, um, it's, it's a you know, minimum viable product, so to speak, that evolves all the time. I'm super happy to, to capture the feedback. Actually, at the very end, there will be a QR code for you uh, for the short feedback. If you like to share something, uh, I'm happy to get there or in any other means. And a little bit about myself, I'm quite into water sports, especially kite surfing right now. So I just recently came from, from the vacation in, in Brazil, where, where I was hoping to learn how to do all those proper tricks where people jump and do a back cross and all those things. Now, what I can tell you, I'm pretty good at jumping and I'm experimenting with landing, so to speak, right? So, so there, there are still some things to learn from me. And I do love dumplings, different dumplings types um, for, for the meal. So um, this, is, this is where I come from now. How did it start for me with the board games, right? So uh, the very first encounter of, of any things that we played at my family was with chess. My father um, likes playing chess and he wanted to teach us. Now this young gentleman that you can see here is actually not me. This is, uh, this is my nephew right now, but this is my father. So he's grandfather for, for, for the nephew and uh, we're still exploring chess. Now, as you can see, uh, it's not always traditional game of chess. Sometimes it's just a random game of whatever whatever kids want to play, but that already gets people or, or kids in the minds of, of trying, exploring, learning some rules and, and having ways to, uh, to play a little bit. Now, uh, uh, during my journey, uh, somewhere during my university uh, days, uh, we actually founded an um, association for playing board games. So we wanted everyone to be able to play. And we thought, hey, I have three games. You have five games. You have six games. How about we join forces, have number of games together, and then uh, play with others as well. So those were open. Uh, sessions on Sundays uh, at one of the schools uh, nearby that everyone could join and play whatever games we uh, we wanted. Uh, and that actually um, broadened our horizons when it comes to games a lot, because right then we had a number of people that could participate, learn how to play, and also pay for the games. And some of the games are pretty expensive, so, so that worked pretty well for us. Now, and we usually we try to play some kind of card games or board games uh, with the family. This is part of my family. Um, we do play with friends uh, on a regular basis. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, we play one on one with my wife as well. As you can see, she's very focused on, <laughs> on making sure that she wins with me uh, on one of, the, uh, one of the games that we have here. So, so as you see, uh, the games um, go in parallel through, through my life from kid to, to, to current state. Now, obviously, there's not always that much time to play those games, but we treat them as a social encounter. So we meet with friends and we play over the games and talk over the games as well. So we can do both at the same, uh, at the same time. Now, that's how it started for me, but uh, of course, it starts differently for, uh, for, for different people. So um, what, um, what usually happens is that, um, that people start with one of the games like Ludo. So in some parts of the world, it's called, and I'm translating here, um, uh, and I'm translating here, it's uh, do not irritate yourself. Right? So that's one type of, um, of uh, name and game. And you basically go around the circle there and try to capture some points and, and so on. So that's one of those games. Now, a lot of people start with the Monopoly or any type of Monopoly game that is there. Um, and you can, you can explore those games. You probably you had a chance to, to play or see it uh, in, in Poland and in a number of countries in Europe. That is one of the first games that people ever played. Uh, we do have uh, apparent and 
I, I was looking for the games uh, that are of traditional Kazakh game and uh, or come from Kazakhstan. And, and, and we were talking with Julia, Julia as well. And, and there, there are two apparently that uh, are familiar to you and potentially you played as kids or, or partner. So one, not that much of the board game, but still the very, um, very known game, ASIC game. And the second one is uh, Togis uh, Kumala. Apologies for, for the pronunciation. So, so those are the games that a lot of people in Kazakhstan had a chance to start their journey with, with the games as well. Um, and my question to you, the question I wanted to ask is, uh, how about you? So if you could follow the QR code that you have here through, through your smartphones, if you do have ones, or you just go to slido.com and you put PMI Kazakhstan uh, there, and there will be a question, what is the first board game you recall playing, right? Or what, what was your starting journey um, with, with the board games? No? So if you, could, uh, if you could share that, then let's see how it goes. I will show you the results as well. So we'll see what happens there with uh, the games. Let me find the Slido for you. Uh, in the meantime, so to speak. Huh? Uh, are we here? Yes, we're here. Okay, so here we are. I see chess, checkers. Okay, so two people responded. Any other responses? If you need QR code, I'll give it here. Okay, so what was the first game that you remember playing? Uh -huh. Let's see if anyone else wants to join and have a check on what's what's there. Okay, check as chess. You're adding something. I'll give you just a bit more time, and then ah. Uh, uh, sorry. There yeah. also can be some complication that currently in Kazakhstan it's 7 p.m. So many people are driving so from their work. Uh, so of course, this is the of course, of course. But, that, that's uh, no worries at all. So what I'll do, um, it, if if you catch on that, we can add it later. If not, then we know that chess and checkers are one of the first games that that you played. So let me just uh, continue here then. Uh, and then if you want to jump with some later polls, that's that's great as well. If not, we, we're good here as well. So with, with that, there is another uh, there is uh, there is another one. And actually, that is for the PMI Kazakhstan. Apologies for that. But what, what we do have here is that there are different types of board games. So I'm just setting the steam here, right? And what we have here is that I'll name number of types of games that you may be having uh, and playing. And on this QR code on Slido, if you want to, to follow up on that, uh, what you can do is uh, say, OK, which of those games are your uh, favorite ones, right? Which ones did you uh, did you like the most or do you like most playing uh, with? So we do have those games that, that, are, um, uh, that are like chess, Go, and so on, this, these types of games. They are called abstract games. And um, now we do have games that are kind of um, games where you do have everyone is playing, but we while we do play against each other, we do not interact that much. It's more of I'll take something that's available as a resource for me rather than for you and so on. So those are usually called Euro or Euro games. Um, and the example here would be Ticket to Ride. You do have party games. Um, and, and the games that you uh, you do um, to play with a number of people having fun. Some of them uh, just last five to 15 minutes. Some of them last a little bit longer, but this is a party game that a lot of people can play. You do have strategy game and grand strategy games where, uh, where usually you play against each other. So you need to win over other players. Now you will have some alliances over the, the, the time and the game, but actually, uh, actually, that will uh, that will mainly be uh, the one only one can win, right? So, so that would be uh, the strategy games. Now, you can have different types of games, be it strategy or Euro, or some others games where you play against a common foe, 
So those games would be called uh, collaborative games. So everyone playing is playing against the, the system, right? Against the the person um, having uh, having uh, not the per not the person, but the system or the uh, or the board game or automatic things coming from from the cards. And now one of the uh, special examples of those games is collaborative game, but the, where you do have um, where you do have one person that is a traitor. So their objective is different from yours, but you do not know who that is. So you need to play to so that everyone wins while someone is uh, assuming that is playing for you with you, but actually is playing against the team. And your job is to find that person at the same time winning the objectives of the game. That person is not to get caught, but as, as you can imagine, win the game, right? So Oh, here. So, and the last, uh, the last type that I have here, there are many more, of course. This is just some aggregation here, right? Is that we do have um, um, Magic: The Gathering is the example of the card games. We do have a lot of card games. Uh, well, your kids or, or someone from your family or even you, right, could have played Pokemon card games, or there is uh, Middle Earth or Dune or a number of other um, setups where you play purely through cards, and there are some rules how you play, play that. Mm, Magic the Gathering is probably the most renowned and known game around the world uh, for this type of games. So these are so, some type of some type of, of games, and I tell you, uh, some of you voted uh, for what you play with. So number of you said other, so we can learn about that as well. And then a lot, uh, then two people or a few people said it's a party game. Some said strategy and some said abstract. So strategy and abstract with the uh, project managers of sort. That's obviously the uh, the thing that you're aiming for. Uh, right? You're thinking in the long term. You want to win. And then the party. That's obviously what comes with the character and the family. So, so that's great. So these are probably the two choices that I, I would be guessing that the project managers would be working with. Uh, all right. And now. Uh, j j just going to, to, to the games and, and the things that we, we can learn, we, we start with thinking, okay, so what is the game? And I was thinking, okay, is there any definition of the actual game or board game uh, there that we can relate to? And one of the things actually coming from the head designer from Magic the Gathering is that the game is a thing with a goal or goals, restrictions, agency, and the lack of real world relevance. So this is a definition that they had. And that got me thinking, like, is it really true that the games do not have relevancy in the real world. Right? And I was thinking just from the relatively recent um, um, things that were happening around the pandemic and the COVID um, situation is that there are some games that while of course they will not solve the problem, they give you the understanding or kids the understanding of how things work and why we should be doing some things, right? So they give this why behind some actions, right? Why we need to, I don't know, close airports for some time, or so how does the disease spread and so on. So just two examples of the games that you can have here is one is Pandemic. So this is collaborative game where you do have a team of four, I believe, players where you want to stop the pandemics from spreading. So randomly pandemics are spreading around the world and you want to stop them. So we need to find a vaccine, you need to uh, stop the, the spread, you need to help suspending uh, the things and so on and so forth. And you do have four different uh, characters there. So be it a scientist, a doctor, a engineer, and so on, someone else, right? How to get this uh, sorted out. So we, only with that game, you learn how people, on the, in the simplistic terms, of course, right? how the uh, people are, uh, are stopping the pandemic. But actually, it's a fun game because you want to win, obviously. You want to stop the pandemic. But then for those with slightly different mindset, there is Pla Plague Incorporated game. So that game goes the other way around. You actually play as a disease. So you want to go around the world and you want to get uh, get people, as many people infected as possible. And you want you, your disease to win. There are a number of diseases. You want your disease to win. So while it's a little Machiavellian uh, setup, what that gives is the interesting understanding of how the diseases can spread and so on and so forth. And again, you want to win, right? So this is a, a, a game that you have there. So just those two examples from the recent things that, that, that shaped a little bit of how the world works today, right? 
do have some relevance to the world. And I was thinking, okay, if that's the case, so maybe there are some professional development lessons, change management lessons that we may have uh, from playing board games. And now here, uh, I do have a few examples, and maybe maybe you you do have uh, you do have experience with those games. So first is actually a card game, uh, and I'll be talking about seven titles. So first is Dixit. Uh, Dixit, what, what I'll do, I will be giving you a very brief intro to the game if you haven't played or, or you don't know it. Right? So very brief intro, and then what lessons I, I take from from this game. All right. So first is Dixit. Dixit is a creative game. You play with the cards. So what happens is that each of the players gets six cards, and you you see those cards, right? The, they do have all those different um, uh, paintings or, or images, and now uh, some of them are very detailed. Some of them have number of things in, in one card. Others do do have only one specific thing. So so they are pretty much random. But usually you can have, have number of things in one of those. And now what you do, if it's my turn, what I do, I look at my six cards. And then I take one of those, right? And I'm thinking, okay, what is something that is coming to my mind when I look at this card? And let's say I look at the, you, you may see those two children and the wolf there, right? So, so this card, I may be looking at this card and I'm thinking, okay, the word or the term that comes to my mind is fear, right? Fear. And so what I do, I put this card face down and I say fear. And now what each of you does, right? Uh, you take you do what you tell you do. You take the card, your cards, and you look for the card that uh, fits best the word that I gave. So in this scenario, that would be fear. And sometimes you have amazing cards that work with that. Sometimes you do not have that much. So for example, for one of you, this blue building at the bottom of the screen could be something that looks as the prison, and prison comes to you with fear. So you're thinking, okay, that reflects fear. So you put your card down. So we take all of those cards. Everyone has put their card. I toss them. I put them face up. And you need to guess which card was mine. So the first card that went there. You only know your scores. You do not know each other's. Card. And as you can imagine, you need to a little bit know me, how I think, or try to guess how I think, and then to learn how that um, that operates and, and where we go with that. Now, so. So this is this is a creative game, very good for for getting to know each other and uh, and having having fun. Now, what what I do uh, do learn from this game is that perspective is key. Now, as you can imagine, it's not like that that everyone will put the same cards for each term that I put. Right? Everyone will have completely different experiences that they will uh, put here. So this perspective, this empathy of being able to put the head of someone else to be able to see the situation and those cards is crucial here to, uh, to be able to, to understand and move. And now one of the business concepts that I also like uh, and, and could be useful here is zoom in, zoom out. So when you look at the people in your workplace, for example, or sometimes at yourself, right? what usually happens is that people are very good in one of two. They're either very detail oriented, so they will jump in to look for small details and then, then work on those details, right? or they will be those, they will call themselves or the visionaries. Right, so helicopter view, high level view, just looking on the ground scale, and then seeing we go in that direction, on their direction. And obviously, you, you need both of those characteristics. But what I see is very useful for the change makers, for the people that actually want to impact and, and uh, make the change, is being able to change those perspectives, not to just go deep and then stay there or go out and stay there, but actually to be able to both zoom in and then zoom out and do it consciously, not when the situation happens that you need to do it, but consciously look from both perspectives, right? So in that scenario, you understand the grander picture, but also you're able to zoom in and see those details in here in those cards, but in the real life as well. And then go back to the perspective and adapt it. If you're talking with CEO, they may be more on the zoom out uh, scale right now. If you talk with some of the specialists, they may be on the zoom in, right? And adapt this perspective and the vocabulary and, and the things, how they work so that you can actually move your project forward and in the game with. So that was 
game number one. Then the second game, and may, maybe you had experience with that game as well, this is uh, Catan or Settlers of Catan. Now, uh, w within that game, what what happens is you randomly put those blocks that you see that, that go as a board, right? Hexagons or uh, types. And then you put numbers on those as well. So you see some, some numbers here as well. And then your goal is to build your cities, villages, and roads. So these are those small buildings of buildings and roads and blocks, right? In your color uh, to ultimately get 10 points, I think. Right? And each building is worth two or three points, road is worth one point and so on. So we need to develop it. To be able to build those, you need to have resources. And those resources you get from those tiles from the board game, right? So you see one of those is reddish, that's ore, right? One of that represents forest, that gets you wood. Then there are some mountains, those gives you stone and so on and so forth. There are five types, I think, of the resources here. And now how you get them, and that's the interesting part, is that you get them to some extent randomly. So you use dice, two dice, and you throw those dice so you can get results from two to 12, because those are dice of six points, right? So from two to 12. And then whatever number comes out, anyone that has anything on the board around this number, right? would get would get uh, those resources so let's look at nine nine is in the middle on the red uh, on the grass uh, sorry on the green on the grass right so you see that there is a lot of orange right and there is um, and there is uh, red as well right so each of them would get some resources orange and red because they are around nine if from those two dice you would get number nine now uh, nobody else would get any resources so in theory, if all the time there would be only nine coming out, right? you would be getting the resources all the time for, for the grass. You, would, you could exchange them and do something with it as well. Now, so, so dead games seems like a random game. And to some extent, of course, is because you never know what comes out from, from the cards. right? But apparently, there are some strategies that you can imply here. Right? There, uh, and, and those would be. Uh, Two things probably. One is focus on the things uh, within your control. Right? So you may control where you put your city. You may control what what you buy and how you exchange uh, things, right? And the second thing, think is plan for increasing your chances. And now, how do you do it in a random game? Well, this is semi-random game from the perspective that all the time. As you play, always nine didn't come out, as we mentioned. But actually, in the large scale of numbers, if you look at the statistics, right, it's six, seven, and eight that will come as the most often uh, played number, right? Because you can get, let, let's aim for eight, right? You can get four plus four, six plus two, five plus three. Uh, and so on, right? So there are so many combinations of the two dice that can uh, give you eight. And the same is with six and seven, right? So those are the most probable ones. Seven has some other meaning in this game, but six and eight are probable. So you can see they are red here, right? So if you put your cities next to six or eight, you have a bigger chance, just chance, it's chance, right? But it's a bigger chance of getting resources and then building your your your, your kingdom and so on. So while it's a random game, you can plan for increasing your chances. And that's exactly the same in, in the business. Now, obviously, you don't know what the market will do for sure. You don't know what the com uh, competitors will do. You even don't know really often what ha will happen within your organization. But to some extent, you can look at, A, the things that are within your control and getting ready and being very sure that you move forward with those. And B, uh, putting some frame around, okay, what's the most probable scenarios, right? Or what things may, may bring uh, best uh, value for price or benefit ratio uh, back. And with that, actually start, start setting up for that. So those are those two. So that was Catan. Then the next game is uh, Ticket to Ride. I'm not sure if, you, if you've played um, this game. Uh, now within Ticket to Ride, um, what happens is that 
mm, you play with few people. This is Euro or Euro game, right? Uh, your goal is to build uh, a train ride between two cities or more. So you do have number of those missions, right? So you can see, oh, there's Constantinople and Bucharest, for example, right? So your mission can be to build a very short trip from Constantinople to Bucharest. But what you can get is you can get a trip from Constantinople to Paris, for example, right? And then you need to go through the whole map. Now, what happens here is that whenever you want to build uh, those, if you block the path, that's only your path unless there are two next to each other, as you can see a little bit on the top uh, between yellow and violet, right? So if there is just one road, a specific direct road, if you take it, that's yours, right? And how you do the, you play, there are cards with different colors of the cards and you get, in each turn, you either get two cards uh, for your hand or you build, uh, the, build the traction. Uh, you can do some other things, but those are the, the main two, right? Now. And within that, what, what you need to do, you need to gather your resources, so those cards in the specific colors. If you want to build on the yellow track, it needs to be yellow card. On the violet track, it needs to be violet track. On the gray one, any color you want, right? So you, you need to gather those, but at the same time, from time to time, you need to build those. But if you do have, let's say, four yellow uh, cards at this moment in time, and you want to build, um, you can either go to one, uh, road or the other, you will use three or four of those cards, and then you need to get more of those um, the next time. So you need to carefully tread and think, okay, what will others do? What are the potential paths that they need to take or want to want to take, right? And depending on them to play accordingly, right? So one of the key quick questions here is, should you hoard, so gather as much as possible and only then start buying when you do have everything ready, or you should spend whenever it comes. Right? And now there's no right and wrong probably, but uh, for me, what usually works out is keeping my options open for as long as possible, right? And this as long as possible means understanding how long till risk exposure changes. Right? How long till the risk exposure changes? So it's not that I already do have all the cards and I can play them immediately, right? It's when I believe that others are more likely to build a road on one of my parts. And because I do have number of resources, I can then quickly buy, buy mine, right? So uh, I, I've seen others playing in different ways, but my experience so far is that this is usually the, the winning strategy. When you keep your options open as long as possible, so you hoard, but whenever you see that exposure changes, so someone started building in the direction where your road may be, then you start spending immediately. And then you start buying uh, there to be sure that you solidify your, um, your position uh, there. And that's exactly the same in the real life, uh, in business. Now you want to keep your options open, right? You don't want to have million of options, of course, but you want to keep your options open and be able to invest in different scenarios depending on what's happening on the business, with the market, within your company, or if you're uh, looking on which project to, to work on in your company, right? So depending on the options and how long you can keep them, right? Sometimes the risk of, someone else taking this project or be it being closed, the one that you want really to work on, right? is very big and you should act immediately. But sometimes you can actually gather a little bit of options and only then decide uh, where to go. It all comes with this risk exposure understanding. So that's a question worth asking yourself and potentially your sponsors, right? Okay, what can change and when it can change so that you can adapt when you need to make a decision. Okay, moving forward, uh, number four, I think, is Sagrada. Sagrada is a beautifully crafted name. This is a dice game. So it's a beautifully crafted game where you throw the dice and then you choose those dice with specific colors and numbers and you put them on your board. You do have, uh, I think, 20 or 25 um, positions where you can put them and you, you see them on the picture here, right? Where you can put them. And then uh, some rules here are wh whenever you do have, for example, this yellow in the right top corner, uh, yellow uh, board, then you can put only yellow dice there. 
if you have uh, on the board a specific number like below the green one you you would have five that means you can only put uh, dice with five there right? and then the other two rules and there are only those rules there is that you cannot put two dice of the same color next to each other they can go in 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 diagonals i think right but they cannot go next to next to each other right and you cannot have two numbers so not two colors and no two numbers next to each other and with those rules you try to fit all the the positions here and then there are some missions right and one mission is that you get uh, as many points of one specific color that is randomly allocated to you at the beginning for each of the points that you have on the dots of this color. So let's say in this scenario, you would be blue. That means you've got four plus one plus one plus two, right? So that's eight points that you would be having at the end of the game if that would be your only blue uh, dice. And then the other ones would be, okay, for example, you, you need, and that applies to everyone, you need to build rows of dice of different color. And then you get six points for each, each of those rows. So you see we have one here fu fulfilled, but unfortunately there are two blue uh, dice, so you cannot, uh, you cannot get the points for that, but maybe you're able to build others. And there are some other rules, uh, uh, missions around that as well. And uh, you, you do have three missions plus this color one, right? So you can have, I don't know, a, a row, a column, or some specific set of ones and twos, and so on that can give you points. And now within that game, my, my take usually was, oh, I need to win all the possible points here. So I need to get as many as possible points from, the, from my color. So ideally only fives and sixes on, the, on this blue, for example. Then I need to have all the missions completed for all the rows, all the columns, for everything, right? And if I do that, uh, I will win. And that's usually true. If you are able to achieve that, you will get so many points that you will probably win. But the tricky part is that this later in the game you are, it's harder and harder to fit the randomly coming dice into your into your boxes that are still free there. So what's true in real life and in this game is that you need to prioritize. You need to know what are you able to, to drop if something will not go your way. So I'm not saying do not aim for everything. Of course, if you're able to aim for everything, that's great. But you need to be able to to say, okay, I will, at first I will drop mission number five, and then I will drop mission number three, if uh, I do not get the right dice, so that I still can get the maximum points from uh, from this scenario. And that makes it, it goes to the maximizing the gain for the long term, right? So looking at the end game, right? Looking at the final scenario, not just, okay, right now I can really fit this dice here, but then it will block me in a few other spaces. And I'll show you just one example here. You see this um, green um, dice on the right uh, with five. This is next to, to the board that says five as well. So unless you use some special special uh, options there, you will be never able to put the, car, the dice on this, uh, below this uh, green one because you cannot, from the rules, you remember, you cannot have those two dice of fives next to each other. And what that really comes down to as well is limited number of choices. So, uh, you, you know, again, you want to aim for everything, you want to win everything, right? But what really helps, and there, were, there was a lot of research actually for that, for, for any of you that work in, with some product managers or, or building e-commerce systems and so on. So. Apparently, what the research says over and over again is if people have too many options and you have too many choices to make, they just drop it. They just want, don't want to do it. So, so one of the experiments was there that there were some people selling gems, I think, but let's say honeys, right, or gems, right? So ge ge gem, sweet gem, right? And then on one side, they were selling three to five of those different types. And on the other one, there was a full palette. So there were 20 or 25 of those, right? So you would guess that if there are more choices, so people would choose theirs and ultimately more people would find something that they like and therefore more people would buy, right? But this was not the case. Over and over again, if there was a more limited number of choices, ultimately the sales were better. 
right? Of course, you need to cover your basis, so you need to have the right amount of those choices there to cover as many thing, uh, options as possible for the clients, but actually too many choices are not good as well. And that's the same true for us, right? If we do have too many choices, we, we may not go for any of those or, or do the decision too late. Remember from the previous one, we may miss when the risk exposure changes because we did not look at all of the options there, right? So, we are maximizing the gain uh, for the long term here. Now, um, true in life, true in business, true in board games, that would be true for all the other games as well. All right, moving forward, uh, I, I think two, two, two more uh, there, or three. So this is, this, is, uh, it, this is grand strategy. This is Twilight Empire. This is a game that takes a number of hours to play, so you need to be ready for that. Uh, and what happens here, you play in the universe or some galaxy, uh, you're one of the races and you want to build your, your, uh, your race survival and winning strategy. But this game is, while what you see here on the board are, are, are cruisers and some spaceships and so on, this is, of course, a military power here as well, but actually you do have a very deep economy, diplomacy, marketing, uh, and a few other uh, things that you need to cover here to be able to balance, uh, balance the game. So, and what happens in this game is that number of people, when they go into the grand strategy, they say, oh, power, I need to win. I need to dominate them. I need to do the... Uh, military strength, right, and get all the board. But in these games, it's extremely hard to get this upper hand on number of other players, especially if you play with six or seven players, right? So that's extremely hard. Uh, you can get part of that, but then the others will usually come in and capture you, right? So what what's actually interesting is, is that you do not win by that. You win by uh, fulfilling some missions and those missions may be actually yes please get this one region of space for yourself through the military means but it may mean exchange some goods with uh, the other player get alliance or maybe get some technology sorted out or a few other a few other things there as well so you get points through very different means that only military stick and you usually cannot get winning points uh, enough winning points only through military means. So you need to define how the success looks like for you. And if it's winning the game, right? So actually getting the enough number of points, you need to look at all the aspects of the game, not just have a narrow focus of, on one of the things. And then once you know what, what, what you need to achieve, remember to check in on it over and over again, because being in the heat of the battle or in the heat of the game, you, you can drop that and you, you may just want to do some things to, to have fun. And that's, of course, your prerogative as well. But actually what you really want to do is measure the success uh, and apply it to the winning strategy. Um, so that's something that I see people really often uh, forget. And with that comes another thing that's true for all, all the games and for ourselves as well, is know your strengths and weaknesses. Now within that game, there are different races and they do have their starting or bonus points. In a number of computer games, you have the same things, right? So some of them are faster, some of them are stronger, some of them are more intelligent and so on. Apply those. If you know what those are, those are your advantage, right? They give you this edge. So, so apply those. So it's super, super important in your job in, as a change maker, right? To know, okay, what do I excel at? How can I leverage some of the things? And, and my strong belief is that while for whatever you are not best at, right? Uh, and that skill set is not crucial for, for, for your project or for yourself, or you can um, empower someone else to, to this kind of things. Well, you, you should get this skill to the minimum level. That's for sure, right? You always need to be able to do some of those things in those needed skill set. But actually, it's much better to strengthening you on whatever brings you most value, right? And wherever you are strong at, because most likely you will then have this tenfold uh, growth uh, with that. Uh, another one, uh, Game of Thrones. So you may have seen the series, you may have read books. There are board games there as well. Um, for that, this is grand strategy as well. 
uh, you become one of the families within the Game of Thrones, and obviously you want to become a king on the north, not only on the north, right? The king of the seven kingdoms there. And what you do, you build your armies, you do get some resources, and then you, you try to get seven castles around, around the board. Now, within those seven castles, you, uh, you do want to, um, uh, to, to get those, but whenever you get close to those, others may attack you. So within the game, you, you build a lot of alliances, right? You want to agree with someone that they will help you, at least for some time, because someone is getting too strong or something happens there and so on and so forth. But ultimately, only one can win, right? So you need to know who you are working with to be able to apply it uh, to the scenario when to know how long in this game, right? How long can you trust them, right? How long will they be with you because something does not change for them and it's your common goal to, to go there, right? And then some of those will be till the end will be your allies because you are agreed on that. Some of those will use the very first moment to, to put, put the knife in your back, right? This is purely the game, right? So everything is, 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 is acceptable within that game because it's your parameters of the game. But actually in real life, knowing your stakeholders, knowing who you're working with, building this ecosystem so you can trust each other. And basically in this game that would go into, you, you ally with someone and you agree that only when one of you get five or six castles, so just one or two to win, then you stop being allies. But other than that, you move to, together somewhere there, may make it or break it for you. Because at least for some time, you are able to navigate and have some part secure. So having those ecosystems, this networking uh, built, uh, being able to negotiate with, with others and sorting things out, convincing them on the going in a different way or helping with your projects. Those are some of the things that are very, very important in, in our um, professional life. And, and finally, the seventh game that I have. So th th this is the game uh, coming from the African setup and it has so many different names, Ayo. Ayuri or Yuri, Yuri, and so on. And, and it goes across a number of countries in Africa and Asia, uh, as I've been told. Now, what you do here, you move the stones and then you try to put your stones on the side of the, uh, of the opponent and then you move them around in, in a specific type. Uh, but some things that people are, are telling me on this game is that you really need to be able to adapt uh, to the situation on how the player responds. It's one-on-one -on -one game, very simple in terms, right? Just moving the stones uh, around, but you need to adapt because there are two things, right? If you put some move, attacking move on someone, it very often, very quickly will come back to you attacking there as well. So you need to balance your stand and know very well when and how to go. And you can kind of move it to what goes around, comes around in, in your real life. And then usually the winning movement in these games comes only once, right? So there are really often opportunities in our professional life of making some change, some impact, uh, talking with someone, getting uh, something sorted out, right? That only comes one, come once. Now, that doesn't matter that there will be no more opportunities. There still will be plenty of other and next opportunities if you know how to look for them. Just this one particular will be uh, will be over. So in this scenario, if you don't capture this opportunity and the other player captures that, uh, their opportunity, they may win, but there will be new games, of course. Right? But knowing when to act and seizing the opportunity, knowing that the karma comes back, that's something that's, that's worth remembering in each of the... Uh, um, each of the personal or professional scenarios. So those were seven games that I wanted to walk you through and I'll do the summary in a second. I do have uh, two bonus slides for you. One is the interesting, uh, interesting poll that was done and it was done purely through with the uh, board game players, the people that, that play uh, board games. Uh, there were 1600, almost 700 of, of those players. So uh, for, for this scenario, that's good representation. And now look at the question that they, uh, that they ask, right? Uh, whenever, uh, we, excluding as a child, so when you were already actually thinking for yourself and not you know, having this specific setup, um, 
for um, the, the kids have the day all they must win or, and then do not understand the rules and so on. So did you ever cheat in the game, right? And look at the numbers, actually, that's quite interesting, right? So never, almost 60% of the people never cheated, right? Some people cheated once or a few times and they said, ah, that's not for us. It's not fun to, to cheat in the game. So I want to play with the real loss. And there were some people, only a few of those, right? That actually, well, either cheated a lot or cheat on a regular basis. Now, and that's probably uh, good to remember uh, because what I think is good to assume in the business, right, uh, is assume good intentions, right? As in playing board games, as in real life, majority of the people do have good intentions. They want to achieve success. They want to help. They want to, to live in, in the peaceful, positive uh, ecosystems, right? Well, sometimes that's not possible, of course, right? And uh, challenging situations happen, right? But a lot of people actually, if they can, Hey, Przemek, your mic went off suddenly. Could you please turn it on? Something with your mic? It has a call, I think. No, it's about the mic when going off. Przemek? Checking the connection? Hello. Hello. Can you hear us? Now we can okay. hear you. Okay. So yeah, where, where, did, where did you drop me? Uh, we dropped you when you were uh, talking about uh, set clear rules. Starting to, to talk about that. Setting. Okay. Ah. Okay. So so pretty close. Uh, so then assume good intentions. Right. And, and uh, the, the people do want to have success. And whenever they do have control uh, over things that are happening, they do want to play with the rules if they believe in them. Right. And they do want to have fun with you as well. And I think that is very transferable to, to the business as well. Uh, but for that, they need to understand the frameworks. They need to understand the rules. Right. So if that's the case, uh, as, uh, make sure that whatever is the framework of your work, how you work, what's what's positive, what's not positive, ways of working, what you agree as the team, building contracts with your teams, having agreement with the stakeholders and and, um, and sponsor, how you want to work, all of that should be uh, clearly stated. And if that's the case, then you uh, you would have a positive um, uh, setup with the people and results there as well. So that's number one. And the second the bonus slide is here that actually board games, other than all those different strategies and the things that you can uh, you can uh, learn or practice, also have a few other points. And among others, there are three elements, right? One, they help you to foster, build up, right? S support your social skills, right? And, and they give you opportunity to meet with others and, and practice some of those, be it negotiations or, or positive um, um, collaboration and so on. Second, especially for the kids, they teach you or they can help you to teach your kids or yourself how to lose. While we, of course, we all would like to be winners and really often it happens, right? Uh, but sometimes, Things do not go our way in the games. If someone wins, that means really often if you do not play cooperative games, then someone else will lose. And that's okay because there will be another opportunity then in a moment in time. Learning how to lose is a, in a positive and professional manner is a very, very uh, looked for a skill set. So giving your kids this exposure. Well, I'm not saying that they shouldn't play to win. They definitely should play to, to, and aim for the win, right? But if it doesn't happen, that they know how to behave. That's a very useful uh, tool for that. And then finally, for your be families, friends, colleagues playing at work sometimes, that helps spending some quality time or together or having some interaction um, of, of the things that you do together. Uh, all right, so to sum up, we do have uh, we do have few things, right? Zoom in and zoom out. So remember uh, about putting different hats and looking from different perspectives, right? By yourself consciously, not only when the situation uh, makes you do it. 
Then remember to look at how long till the risk exposure changes. Look at the opportunities from that perspective, right? How long can I keep my options open and then act accordingly, but swiftly, right? Now, maximize gain for long term. So remember prioritization, remember about uh, making sure they understand what you're aiming for and how many choices you have there, right? And then define how the success looks like, right? Be sure that you know how, um, what you want to achieve, what's, and then you can apply the winning strategy. And that comes with measuring those things as well. Uh, be sure that you know uh, who you are working with, right? So know your stakeholders, know how they think. They may be looking from different perspectives, but also they may work with different teams in a different way. So setting the frameworks and making sure that works would be pretty, uh, pretty useful. Uh, Usually, depending how you behave, if you're professional, if you're positive and so on, that will come back to you at job. So what comes around goes around. And then assume good intentions with everyone that you're uh, be it playing or, or working with. So thank you very much. Uh, let the dice roll always in your favor. Have fun. If you'd like to, to, to give me some feedback, then I'll put the survey on shortly. Um, if you have any comments or questions, I'm here. So let me just put it there. And then thank you for being here and um, um, making sure that, uh, you know, uh, we move forward with the board games community further and get those things uh, in the real life as well. I do have this one slido for you. Let's see. Uh, that will be here, right? whether you liked it or not, so I can leave it here. But in the meantime, if you've got any questions, comments, or want to share something, I'm super happy to hear that. Thank you, Przemek. That was a really uh, important uh, speech from a founder of a board game club, club, by the way. So this is really great. <laughs> and thank you. I especially like this uh, remark about um, learn how to Lose because uh, this is December. This is the end of the year. We are all culture of achievers, and the burnout is close. So, <laughs> just to be ecological to ourselves and our teammates, I think this is a very important remark. And I can see that some of our attendees uh, is having a question. Askar, I can see your hand. Please feel free to turn on your mic and ask the question to Pshen. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. First of all, Przemysław, dziękuję bardzo for paying attention and showing respect to our language and culture. Yeah, I would like to say you cześć. Nazywam się Astar. Mam jedno pytanie. Great. Of course, yeah. Uh, five years ago, I learned uh, Polish language with my friends. Yeah, from Krakow. So nice. my question, uh, games uh, can help us to improve some skills, but uh, at the same time, uh, we can go too deep in passion and start wasting time. So how to fill this border? How to identify the time or how can I say, the level when you need to stop <laughs> and not go too, uh, too deep? Yeah. Right. Well, that's an excellent question. And well, I, I'll, first I'll give you the answer of any proper project manager. It depends, right? And now what does it depend to? So my take is, well, you, you, what you usually do, right? Is you look at the specific goals in your private, professional, social life, right? And uh, what you can probably see, be it measure or at least feel, is to know, uh, am I moving forward with my goals? Am I am achieving those, right? And if I'm not doing well in my professional life, because I don't know, I'm not getting promoted or I do not move as fast as possible that I wanted to, then I start looking at what can be hinders or what can be the things that are blocking me there. Uh, and if I see the, oh, by the way, maybe I'm not used, uh, looking at Netflix for, for, for eight hours a day, but I'm actually playing board games all the time with everyone uh, on every free moment and I do not have time to develop myself or, or work or think about those things. That would be something that I would be looking at that. Now, my take is that uh, for 
roughly two times a week is a good setup and timing for playing board games, be it with your family or with uh, with friends, because that can help you develop and at the same time have the quality times with them. Now, on top of that, you can have games with your professional colleagues. Actually, there are a number of games on the change management, risk management, and a few other things that you can learn something together with that. So actually, this is kind of moving your professional uh, way forward. And then if the game is a longer game, and that would be, I don't know, six hours or so, and there are those games there as well, then I would say not, well, probably, well, I, I would say once every quarter, twice every quarter, that's something that you can probably manage and fit in your schedule. If you're playing all the time those, then, for, well, it depends on your schedule and working environment, but I think that's quite a lot of time that you can put into those things. Not sure if I answer it, but that would be my thoughts there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is great. Thank you. Yeah, I, I also can say that sometimes these games really are so exciting and you are kind of trying to exchange those for real life. Well, yeah, thank you for this suggestion. Um, what about other attendees? Um, Colleagues, do you have any questions? We still have some couple of minutes uh, to ask in the chat or um, in voice. By the way, uh, Przemek, check the chat area because I can see some very <laughs> funny comments over there. <laughs> Not the questions, but comments. Uh -huh. So yeah, um, if no more questions, just the last asking, do you guys have any questions? Yeah, I can see no questions overall, but just in case you still have some questions left, do not forget to contact Przemek in his LinkedIn profile uh, or somewhere you can really find him. Przemek, thank you very much for taking this time uh, to share with us these important lessons. I was listening to uh, this speech already for a second time and still I got many things that I learned like as new things and this is really amazing. I think uh, this is really thinking outside of outside of the box while doing something a part of our job and still excelling professionally. So I think this was a very important event. So thank you, Przemek. Let us cooperate further. Probably next time, maybe you will tell us how to get ready for the program management professional exam. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who knows? It was already some time ago, but who knows? So, so Julia and the team, uh, thank you very much for, for the invite. Pleasure to be here. Uh, I see some questions about the presentation and video. So video, yes, I think Julia will be sending presentation. If you want specific this presentation other than the video, just ping me on the LinkedIn. I'm happy to share. Um, and then yeah, if you would have any other questions, probably LinkedIn is the best way that, that I'll uh, answer those. Yeah, thank you. And it would be great if maybe you could send us the LinkedIn link right to the chat area. So yeah, uh, uh, Sergey, in response to the question, we will definitely share uh, the slide deck once we get it from Przemek. And also you will find our uh, recording on the YouTube as Przemek already approved today and we will send it by email within a couple of days. And also, um, you can get one PDU for this event, uh, apart from Przemek, because Przemek, you can get additional PDUs, you know that, <laughs> for getting ready for this event. And we are also sending over the PDU code right in the email shortly within a couple of days. So thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. Have a good the remaining of the day, Przemek, and thank you, and let us keep in touch. Thank you. Bye-bye. And I'm stopping the recording.